Hi. You are watching. On the slope of a lonely dune a group of people stood waiting for the completion of the ritual of the same name. One of those gathered said that he needed to pass the last test called the Devil's Illusion in order to become immortal. He also said that he needed help to do this, and the girl next to him replied that they would take care of everything. The group of people consisted of the demon Jiu Yao, the fairy Wan Hua and the emperor Dan Qing, who were friends of Tang Xiao, part of whose soul fell into this world and he spent a thousand years, but now he is one of the immortals of this world and today is the day of his coming. The ritual began and Tang Xiao was completing his final stage of establishing his immortality. His friends helped him pass this test using their magical abilities. However, the fairy's intentions were somewhat different regarding Thane, and she planned something insidious during his test. The test of illusion took place with the active participation of everyone present, but Tang suspected something was wrong. Under the influence of magic, Tang felt that the test was getting out of control, and an ancient scroll peeked out from his bosom. It was a scroll about the supreme art of space and at that moment the fairy shouted that Tang should accept the celestial technique. Taking advantage of his helplessness, the fairy reached out to take this scroll from him while the others were waiting for this moment. Seeing that his friends were conspiring against him to take the scroll, he shouted that he did not believe that they could do this to him. Taking the scroll in her hands, the fairy said that from today she is like the lady of the city of Hugh Kane will be Lord Hing Hu instead. Being constrained and unable to even move, Tan shouted that he would never forgive them for this. His body seemed to be torn from the inside from the effects of magic and he screamed in pain and despair that his friends had cheated on him. The next time he opened his eyes, he heard that they were asking him where he had hidden some money. His mother turned to him asking if nothing had happened to him, but he clearly remembered that he was in an illusion and was ready to die and he was probably still under the effect now. Tang's cousin sarcastically told him not to pretend to be unconscious and to tell them the truth. Tan sat and did not understand where he was and what was happening to him, because he was supposed to die during the test. His whole family, consisting of his mother, uncle, aunt and cousin, stood in front of him and everyone looked at him, waiting for an answer. During the accident, the guy's body was almost unharmed, but part of the wounded soul went to the immortal world and entered the body of the rich grandson of the leader of the Holy Church of the Crimson Bird, but he did not expect that he would die in the immortal world and his soul would return to his body on earth. Su Shan Wen's uncle still continued to find out where Tang Xiao hid the money, raising his tone. Tan's mother insisted that he couldn't just steal them and justified her son in every possible way. She hugged her son, waiting for confirmation of her words that he did not steal that money and this was slander. But the uncle shouted angrily that he would teach the guy discipline if his mother couldn't do it. Like a loving mother, she stood up for her child, protecting him from his uncle's wrath. But this did not stop the uncle and he slapped his mother in the face for covering up the criminal. Seeing this, Tan was furious at his uncle's act, because he had no right to beat his mother, and he furiously rushed at him with the desire to finish off the scum. Sparks fell from his eyes and without hesitation he hit his uncle in the face, showing all his angry strength. From such a strong magical blow, the uncle flew across the entire room, catching the frightened glances of everyone present. Tang's fist was still blazing with superpower while the uncle was puzzled by his nephew's unexpected attack. Landing against the wall, the uncle lost consciousness or scared his entire family and created hatred towards Tang. Tang himself was surprised that he used the art of the igniting source, because he could not imagine that it could be used on earth. The wife immediately ran over to check if Uncle Su Shang was alive and tried to bring him to his senses while their son shouted indignantly that such a weakling like Tang could not have so much strength. With undisguised rage, the cousin bared his fists, showing that he did not intend to leave Tan without avenging his father. Looking at his father, he threatened Tanya that he would call the police and if anything happened to his father, he would certainly pay for it. His look was surprisingly angry and confused, and Tang, rubbing his fists, thought that he had to return to the immortal world to take revenge on his traitors. Soon a police squad arrived at their house, finding out what happened to the unconscious man and who was to blame. Su Shang came to his senses, but still felt unwell and his head was painfully painful from hitting the wall. He saw two policemen in front of him asking different questions, but he still could not come to his senses to answer them. The woman took out her badge and introduced herself to Su Shang as chief of police Chen Zumi. Having finally understood what was happening, 
he pointed his finger at Tang and said that he had stolen 3,000 yuan from his family and he demanded his arrest. Tan stood by his mother and objected in a calm tone that he had not stolen any money. The police chief in turn asked if this guy was the one who beat up Mr. Su Shang. In his defense, Tang said that it was just a defense and the first uncle attacked him, but Su Shang chose a different tactic by getting personal with the boss, as if he knew the director of this place and often dines with him. Having established contact with the boss, he continued that this bastard robbed and beat him, and he needs to be arrested immediately. Added even more fuel to the fire regarding why Tan did not tell the police where his house was. This remark was obviously unnecessary and infuriated the boss, because she knows better what to ask and in what order. Meanwhile, Tan's health worsened and he remembered that he forgot to use sacred techniques to protect his weak body from the influence of magic, because it would not withstand it. His mother became concerned about his condition and, coming up to ask if everything was okay, she saw that blood was running like a river from Tan's nose. He attracted the attention of everyone present, including Chief Shimei, who immediately headed towards him. She placed her hand on his neck to check his pulse as he stood still, awaiting her verdict. At first there was silence between them, but after a second the chief said that this was the result of internal injuries, but now there should be no problems. She turned to the group and asked who would tell her what happened here and Tan's brother hurriedly replied that today was his father's birthday and Tan and his mother came here to eat. He added that two days ago he and his brother had to pay three and a half thousand yuan to the university, but his brother did not bring the money. Then he left his money in exactly the same amount on the table and it disappeared, so that suspicion falls only on Tan. The boss interrupted him and asked if there was evidence that it was Tan who took the money from him. She continued that it was a strange coincidence that he had such a sum, but the guy hesitantly replied that it was just a suspicion. The chief sadly asked if ordinary suspicions could cause a fight, but promised to investigate the disappearance of the money, but everyone needs to keep their mouths shut. Everyone gathered waited while the police carried out a search and Tan tried to reassure his mother as if everything was fine with him and it was just the consequences of fatigue. Half an hour later, a policeman came out to them with money in his hands and said that he had found it in the closet, as well as a shoe print next to it. The chief took the initiative into her own hands and said that there was no point in lying and let the person who did this confess to the police and not waste their time. Su Shang shouted that this was some kind of misunderstanding, but Tang was completely calm and his conscience was clear, although it seems he already guessed whose hands it was. Trying to prove something, Su Shang was interrupted by his son, who said that he just wanted to make a joke and it shocked him. The glances of those present alternately intersected and the guy began to make excuses that he did not think that everything would end this way, but the boss pointed her finger at him and said that that meant he was the theft. Su Shash began to defend the situation by saying that there was nothing criminal about hiding his own money and apologizing for falsely summoning his son. He continued that despite his relationship with the director, the quarrel with the police had nothing to do with it, while his wife spoke with Tang's mother, that Su Xiang would apologize and they would forget about everything. Su Shang also threw towards Tang's mother so that she would not forget that Tang Hu is also a student at Xingue High School and with his connections, he can kick her out of her job. She couldn't stand such insolence especially after her son was wrongly accused of theft, so she shot Su Shana in the back of the head. He held his face in pain while behind his mother's back, Tan laughed with all his might. Tang was proud of his mother's courage and praised her for the tasty blow to Uncle Shang's arrogant Makitra. But at that moment he felt even worse and he could barely stand on his feet and his mother ran up to him to hold him. The chief got scared and also ran to help, seeing that the guy was fainting. She caught the guy in time, supporting him by the shoulders, although it was difficult given his weight. However, the guy still fell to the ground, unconscious, and the chief ordered her colleague to call for backup to arrest everyone. Trying to feel the pulse, the boss was stunned by what was happening to the guy and she didn't understand how this was possible. Tan was taken to the hospital and his mother sat over him until midnight, begging God to wake up. She looked at his indifferent face for hours, watching for at least any changes. However, his consciousness was far beyond the boundaries of the earthly world and he meditated in search of a balance between yin and yang. Fragments appeared before him from the unconscious practice of God's technique, which could be practiced by both demons and gods, and little strength was needed from the practitioner to begin this practice. While he was in another world, he did not need to practice, 
because he was already powerful, but now his earthly body is too weak and requires certain conditions, but it was precisely for his power and mastery of this technique that his friends and wife cheated on him. His consciousness was filled with energy and he burst out from the super strong pressure inside. Feeling the approach of death, he woke up screaming, lying on a hospital bed next to which his mother was sitting, surprised and at the same time happy. She excitedly asked what happened and if perhaps he had some kind of nightmare, but he assured that everything was fine with him and that was the only thing she wanted to hear. She noticed that he had a fever and said that she would bring cold water to wash himself and he sincerely thanked her for her concern. While his mother was fiddling with the water, he thought that fulfilling the conditions in practice would not help a weak body retain the stellar energy that practice would bring. The first level of God's technique does not train the body and you need to start with breathing, skin, flesh, and bones, because if there is too much energy, then his body will simply be torn to pieces, but his thoughts were interrupted by his mother, who had already brought water. She wanted to help him wash his body, but he embarrassedly refused, after all, he was already an adult for such a thing, but his mother assured him that she had seen everything and he should not be embarrassed by her, and these words reassured him. While he was undressing, his mother said that the doctors had found out that everything was fine with his body and that the injuries from the accident had long since healed, but just in case, she asked her son how he was feeling. He replied that he felt much better after vomiting blood, but his mother continued that after he hit his uncle, he might be expelled from high school. Tan objected that his uncle would probably no longer create problems for them and, calming his mother, said that everything would be fine and he was glad that she was okay. These words touched her and she hugged her son, asking how he managed to express his feelings. He assured her not to worry and said that he would become a better person, mentally rejoicing that after a thousand years he saw his mother again and would now protect her under any circumstances. After being discharged from the hospital, Tan felt better and continued to attend high school. The class was on break and everyone was looking at their results from the last test that week. Looking at his result, Tang thought that the part of his soul remaining here was obviously very stupid. At that moment, the school friend felt sad and decided to sneak up on Tan, heading towards his desk. Meanwhile, Chief Shumei was talking to her father, explaining that the guy named Tang Xiao was abnormal, but her father continued to sit calmly in the chair, looking out the window. She continued that with a special technique for measuring the pulse, she noticed that the guy had severe internal injuries, but after he lost consciousness, the pulse accelerated and the wounds instantly disappeared, but this is impossible and the doctors said the same thing. Then the father turned around and asked if he really had a pulse after fainting, added, and Xiaoyumiai shouted that she could not make a mistake in such elementary things. She was angry at her father's constrained reaction to her words and, taking a bottle of wine from the table, said that for today he had enough to drink. Walking towards the exit, she furiously added that she was looking for a way to cure his internal wound, but her father continued to sit thinking about the interesting personality of a guy named Tang Xiao. While a classmate was sneaking up behind him, Tan felt that someone was approaching and became wary. Tan got ahead of his friend and abruptly stood up from the table when he tried to grab him and his classmate fell onto his desk in defeat. The fall was unexpected and very painful for some sensitive areas, so my friend graded the whole class in pain. Maintaining a calm appearance, the friend with tears in his eyes said that Tan had an incredible reaction, but Tan, in turn, worried about whether everything was okay with him and received an approving answer. They looked at Tan's test result and the friend was surprised by the guy's destructive knowledge, but Tan assured that next month he would have a better result, but to his friend this seemed possible only when Tan killed everyone who was better than him. Tang Xiao did not waste unnecessary words and only said that next month everything will become clear, but their conversation was interrupted by the teacher calling Tang Xiao to him. The teacher told Tang Xiao to pack his things and leave, but his friend, who heard all this with ridicule, said that they had not done anything wrong yet to be kicked out so early. Tan removed his friend from the conversation and asked the teacher what happened, and he replied that he was being transferred to another class, because their class did not need such a bad student. The teacher continued that transferring to another class was his only option to stay at Hingyu Institute, otherwise he would be expelled and Tan heard everyone in the class whispering to him to get out of here as soon as possible. Tang Xiao turned to the class and saw that everyone was impatiently waiting for him to leave and throwing various images in his direction. 
But Tang Xiao's friend Yang Chuling did not support the opinion of the majority and, taking the chair in his hands, pointedly threw it on the desk as a sign of his protest. He said that when his boss Tang Xiao became the best in the course, no one would dare to mock him, but for the director it seemed like some kind of nonsense. Tang Xiao tried to calm his friend down and advised him to concentrate on his studies while he was already packing his things to leave. Passing by the teacher, he heard a phrase addressed to him that it was better for him to leave the institute altogether in order to save money for his family. At these words, Tang Xiao turned to the director and crumpled the examination letter and threw it at his feet, which caused a strong reaction of support from Yen Chuling. The teacher was angry and he told Ian that one more word and he would have kicked him out too if not for his parents, but this did not stop Ian and in front of the teacher he raised his desk above his head. He further said that there was no need to remember his parents and, returning to Tan, said that he would go with him to another class and take his own desk in case there were not enough seats. The teacher shouted at Yang to stop doing stupid things to the caustic answer he received that he himself wanted him to leave, and Tan looked at his friend with surprise that he was leaving the class for him. After these words, the friends left the class while the teacher shouted after Yang Chuling, who was carrying the desk above his head, to return to his class. At this moment, the teacher received a call asking how everything went, to which he replied that it was not very good, but Tang Xiao's expulsion was almost confirmed. But the professor of another class, Han Qingwu, assured the school principal to give Tang Xiao another chance and now he has been transferred to the class, but at the other end of the phone, Uncle Su Shang said that perhaps Tang Xiao will not last there for long, because for the transfer certain conditions must be met conditions. Meanwhile, our friends were walking to a new class, talking, and along the way they were met by a new teacher, Han Qingwu. She approached Tang Xiao with the introduction of herself as his new homeroom teacher, not paying attention to Yang, who almost fell in love with the teacher at first sight. But Tang Xiao froze, falling into memories from his previous life in the world of immortals, while Yang tried to accept him. This surge of memories caused an incredible resemblance between the class teacher and his traitorous wife Wan Hua from the previous world. They entered the 10th grade and began the usual lesson of reviewing the material studied in order to prepare for the exams. But Tang Xiao had no time for lessons, because he could not understand how one could be so similar to his wife, and the teacher noticed his diligent and even evil look. At the end of the lesson, Tang Xiao was in a mood for conflict and met the teacher in the corridor, seething with anger. He grabbed her hands and began shouting why she continued to do this to him, but she did not understand the reason for such aggression and was even scared. Yang approached his friend and said that it was only Professor Han and that he shouldn't treat her like that, after which he carried Tan away from the teacher. Realizing what he had done, Tan said that he was going to class, and Yang began to make excuses to the professor that Tan is usually not like that and let her not be offended by him, but he himself did not fully believe his words. But Han Qingwu burst into tears and thought that Tang Xiao must have already found out everything, so he attacked her. At the next lesson, Tan sat and thought that perhaps he had made a mistake and the teacher was not his wife, but simply looked like her, and he felt ashamed of his action. He remembered what she told him at the end, but the memory seemed to fade and he decided to focus on his studies anyway. He leafed through the textbook and realized that he did not understand a word and then he thought that even if his body returned to the earthly state, the feeling of immortality should remain. He received his other textbooks with the thought that this should be enough for the first time. Tang Xiao flipped through the textbooks and instantly memorized everything, but all his classmates laughed at his inappropriate gesture in their opinion and the teacher was also surprised. He read all the textbooks on the program not only during lessons, but also during breaks, and even received comments from the mathematics teacher in whose lesson Tang Xiao was reading history, but this did not stop him. Even after classes, he did not pay attention to anything except books and sat in the library until the evening, and even Yang was already tired and went home while Tan was still studying textbooks. Having finished reading, he was pleased that in just one day he had memorized the entire subject related to the university entrance exam. He went to put books on shelves and came across a very interesting and strange publication. It was the Sien Encyclopedia of the same name Chena in which the guy found information about medicines that will help him with the cultivation of the first level of divine technique. With this medicine, he would be able to strengthen his body so that it could withstand the side effects of the divine technique. He learned that this medicine was found in the mountains and according to Feng Shui, 
this mountain has a spiritual basis and is an ideal place for cultivation. But another question arose, where to get the money to buy land and construction, not to mention other materials that are needed for cultivation, because the earth is a material world and to begin with it will need a lot. His thoughts were interrupted by a phone call from his mother and he switched to talking with her. But it was not mom, but neighbor Tia, Zhang said that the restaurant in their house was destroyed and that he should immediately come home and with these words, Tang Xiao threw away his textbooks and flew out of the library. He ran for strength and didn't even pay attention to the friend who turned to him, because his mother's life was the most important at that moment. Tang Xiao ran past Yang without noticing him and he suspected that something serious must have happened. At this moment, three criminals completely destroyed the room where Tang Xiao's frightened mother was. Soon Xiao appeared and the criminals continued to mock the helpless woman, instilling even more fear. Having knocked out the guy with one blow, they approached, laughing, that Tang Xiao definitely doesn't know how to hold bruises, and his mother began to ask why they came, because they have excellent relations with landlords and they solve problems with deferred payment directly. One of the criminals replied that they needed to pay immediately, otherwise they should get out of here, and meanwhile Xiao tried to get up, which made the criminals laugh. But despite the ridicule, Xiao stood up, which caused surprise among the criminals that the guy wanted more cuffs, but as soon as the criminal swung the bat, Xiao caught it in front of his face, showing that he is not as simple as he seems. The criminal did not show his fear of the guy's supernatural power, and this angered him even more. He tried to grab his bat back with both hands and told Xiao that if he didn't want to die here, he should let him go kindly. But Xiao was not frightened by his threats and, bringing up the bat, he charged the criminal with his fist into the arrogant face with the power of divine technology. The disarmed criminal could not resist the super-powerful blow and Xiao watched as he fell, grimacing in pain. Having dealt with one bastard, Xiao also prepared a portion of his divine technique for the other two. The third of them tried to take the bat from Xiao, but he was not so easily fooled, and he intended to show it. Turning around, he kicked the third criminal, rejoicing in his power. Xiao's mother could not believe that her son was capable of such a thing and, having dealt with the raiders, he looked at how they suffered from pain. Clearing his throat, the leader of the group of criminals threatened that Xiao had hit the wrong person, because he did not know who sent them. He continued that they were sent by Su Shan Gwen from the real estate agency, therefore Xiao is already dead, but Xiao was only encouraged by his own uncle's idea. Xiao slowly approached the criminal while he fearfully asked what he wanted to do with him and tore him off the floor by the throat, as if it did not cost him any effort. With his mystical eyes, he watched as the criminal slowly ran out of air and suffocated in his hands. Another of the robbers began to ask Xiao to let her husband go, but Xiao looked at him with a look filled with hatred and malice. The third of them took a different path and turned to Xiao's mother to stop him before he became a murderer and she took advice in trying to stop her son. But the enraged Xiao was difficult to stop and he was so angry that he did not intend to leave the scum under the leadership of Uncle Shang alive. He shouted that no one would care what happened to this freak, and the mother was surprised by such cruelty of her own son. Xiao almost completed the job, but at the last moment someone pulled him by the hand and he turned around to look at who else's life here was not so valuable. It was Yang who said that by killing this man he would go to jail and there would be no one to look after his mother and Xiao finally let the criminal go, reluctantly taking his hands from his neck. The criminal fell to the floor, clearing his throat, gasping for fresh air, while everyone present watched him. He croaked that the fat guy shouldn't stick his nose where he shouldn't, but looking at Ian, he was ready to take his words back. Sitting on the floor, he fearfully asked if the guy belonged to the Yang Chunling family, although he already knew the answer. Chuling dispassionately replied that this was so, and at that moment he saw fear on the thief's face. And then the thief began to apologize that they did not know that a tip from a stranger would lead them to his friend's restaurant and he sincerely hoped for mercy. Chuling listened to him and kicked him in the face, saying that they had three days to find money to restore the restaurant and escape from the city. The thief fearfully agreed to everything, and Chuling turned to the other two and ordered to get out of there, and they quickly began to leave. Seeing the criminals hobbling towards the exit, Xiao became suspicious and ordered them to stop. He approached them and said that he did not trust crooks like them and raised two fingers up to make sure that their promise was true. He hit them at vital points on their necks and threatened that if they did not come in three days, they would suffer the consequences. 
Chu Ling shouted after them again and they stumbled and raced to the exit and Xiao thanked him for his help, but for Chu Ling it was nothing. But Xiao turned to his mother and asked if she was okay and she replied that she was just very scared, and she asked back whether everything was fine with him, but he asked why she didn't pay the rent this month and received the answer that she paid for his education with the money for the rent. She added that even if he didn't go to school at all, she had to do it and Xiao reassured her so that they wouldn't talk about it anymore, because she already had enough problems. Chu Ling was touched by such tenderness, which attracted attention to himself, and Xiao's mother invited him to stay with them for dinner, to which he agreed. And as Chu Ling walked Su's mother into the kitchen and offered his help, Su had something in his mind. After dinner, the guys went out for a walk and Chu Ling asked how Xiao knew martial arts, because it was so cool and he wants to be able to do the same, so he expects personal lessons from Xiao. Xiao replied that the coolest thing was that his name alone was enough to bring the thieves to their knees and he sincerely thanked for the help, but Chuling modestly replied that Xiao had too high an opinion of him. Chuling reminded Xiao of their first meeting, when he was bullied for his low grades even though he was from such a respected family. Everyone knew that his place in this school was bought by wealthy parents and despised him, but Tang Xiao came to his defense. He said that no one in this room is richer than him, but no one gets higher grades than him. Chu Ling remembered these words well and he is one of those people who knows how to give thanks well. He added that Xiao should not hesitate to ask him for money if he needed it, but Xiao would not ask, but he wanted to ask one question that concerned him about the millionaire's son. Xiao asked if there was a way to quickly win a large sum of money and Chu Ling thoughtfully replied that perhaps in the lottery. Chu Ling pointed his finger at some gambling establishment and said that here you can try your luck. It was a casino with a screaming slogan, from which an angry cousin Xiao was just coming out, screaming, having lost a large amount of money. They made eye contact, but both were not happy to see each other after the latest events. Xiao and Chu Ling went into the gaming room, where cosmic sums of money were spinning, and the one who was unlucky was sitting on the bar and drinking out of grief that he did not know how to place bets. The manager approached him and told him to go look at the person who wins in any casino machine and that was Su, near whom a crowd of fans had gathered. The husband thought it was just luck, but when the manager said that yesterday they had reduced the odds of winning on all the machines and that second Xiao won again, it aroused suspicion. Chu Ling was the most ill and said that Xiao was like the reincarnated god of fortune, but these words were too loud to describe his humble persona and just as they were about to start playing again, they were stopped. Chu Ling received an appeal from a man who had recently been sitting at the bar, and was now watching the incredible play of a young guy. Chu Ling knew this man named Long Zhenglin, so he asked what he was doing here, to which he received a short answer that this was his casino. Meanwhile, an enraged Su Xiang was heading towards the car while the servants tried to catch up with him, but he was too focused on meeting Tang Xiao. He replayed in his head Xiao's last phrase that he and his family would pay for everything they had done to his family and Su Xiang did not understand how he could make him pay for anything. Taking the phone in his hands, he dialed the police number and reported that he had noticed two students in the casino, because there was a punishment for this. Chu Ling, meanwhile, argued with the casino owner to pay them everything they won today and the owner said that as soon as they check the serviceability of the machines, they will definitely pay everything. Xiao warned that they were coming soon go home so let them hurry up with the check and when the manager finished, he sadly announced that all the cars were in good working order. The owner didn't believe it, because it's impossible to win all the time, so he looked again himself and was shocked by the truth. Xiao and Chu Ling stood behind them and waited for them to complete this circus with the primary. The owner turned to Xiao and noticing his impatience, said that he would pay everything and between words asked whether Yang was his friend but Xiao asked whether it was important at all, while the owner was surprised to think that an ordinary child could win with an extremely low probability of winning. At that moment, the police burst into the establishment, saying that they had arrived in response to a call from students who were there. Chief Chen Xiumei told everyone to stay in their places and cooperate with the police, and Xiao realized that this was a serious problem. The owner of the establishment turned to the guys and told them to follow him and he would secretly take them out of here. The chief noticed some activity and ordered a not to move, and realizing that someone was trying to escape, she ran towards the sounds from the room. She burst into the room shouting for everyone to raise their hands up, but all she saw was an empty room and an open window. Running to the window, she saw the car driving away and was defeated, 
but after thinking, she realized that one of the fugitives was the same guy Tang Xiu. Meanwhile, the fugitives were driving carefree in the car and Chuling thanked for the rescue, but reminded the owner to give them the money they won, to which he replied that he was a man of his word and Chuling should know about it. Noticing Xiu's serious face in the mirror, Long Zhenglin asked if this was the first time he had won so much at the casino. He continued that there is one big bet and Xiu will be able to get a considerable amount of money regardless of whether he wins, because even if he loses, the amount is 10 million. Xiao thought about it and Jinglin added that they were offering 100 million for winnings and he liked this information better, so he saw no reason not to go there. Chuling was delighted in anticipation of fun, but Jinglin said that this bet is a business secret and Yang cannot go there, but there are no questions for Xiao, but an appropriate image must be created for him. While they were driving, Chuling was indignant that he was not allowed to attend such a grandiose event and asked in every possible way to join them. They arrived at the Long family's hotel, which towered over the city, glittering with gold and bright lights. Under the dome of this hotel, a game was taking place between two men and behind them stood advisors, one of whom asked Boss Long if it was all worth it to continue the game, to which he replied that one more victory and the game would be over. The other player's advisor continued that according to the contract, he would have to give up the right to build, giving it to his rival Long, and Long's advisor advised the game to give up and not continue the game. The player, in despair, apologized to Boss Long, but he assured him not to worry, because the game was decent, and in the meantime, the player opposite offered to play again. Long was very angry with the way his opponent was behaving and he radiated anger with his entire appearance. The players were still sitting at the table and the advisor asked Long if they should continue playing. After thinking, Long confidently replied that the game continues and it's worth it. At that moment, our heroes in suits entered the hall and Zheng Lin told those present that they would not win his family so easily. Long was surprised by the appearance of Zheng Lin and even with a stranger, but Zheng Lin explained that this was his friend who would help them in this situation and he noticed that they had arrived just in time. Xiao said that he was in a hurry and wanted to start the game as quickly as possible, but Long called Zheng Lin aside to discuss something. He thanked for the help, but assured that this time everything was very serious, but Zheng Lin assured to trust him, because he was confident of victory. Having no other choice, Long agreed and announced to the crowd that the decisive game had begun. Zheng Lin turned to the enemy, giving him the right to choose the game, and he chose to throw the dice and one of his defeats in this game would mean a total loss. Xiao agreed and asked to begin, and the enemy began to mix the bones in the leather case. Watching his opponent concentrate on the case, Xiao realized what his previous success was. Xiao also made his move and the player opposite was stunned that the guy was using the same technique as him, which was impossible to remember the first time. He opened his case, under which there were three sixes, as well as his opponents, which meant a draw. Xiao suggested adding a cube to each new game to make it more interesting, and the opponent agreed, praising the young man for his ability to have fun. They spread the dice and old Zhang slyly told Xiao that he wanted to see how he planned to win it this time. The players shook their cases of dice in unison, looking each other straight in the eyes. And for the second time both players had the same number on the dice, which was again declared a draw. Next time, Xiao again concentrated on the technique that helps control things and rolled the dice. His result was no longer so comforting and his opponent asked if he wanted to continue, to which he received a remark from Su that he did not know the rules, while Long's advisor was already happy that the right to build in the Zhai Zone Shaipina is in their pocket. Hearing the name of the place where the players were fighting, Xiao realized that this was the place he saw in the book and which was ideal for cultivation. Zheng Lin tried to briefly explain to Xiao what was what and started with Long, who was his brother, next to him was an employee of their company Chen Zhizhong, and the opponent sitting opposite is known as the King of Jia Pond Ruedao. One day, he invited the CEO of the company, Zhang, and her brother to play together for their benefit. Meanwhile, the game continued, and the players threw away their dice again, but Xiao said that they already had 12 dice and they needed to finish the game, because he was in a hurry. The opponent agreed, but thought that this guy was a real genius and he needed to establish contact with him, because in the future he could be useful, and at that moment the counting of cubes began. This game was the last, because someone got 1-5 and everyone present looked at each other silently, making a verdict. They could play indefinitely, 
but Mr. Jia got a smaller number and he thanked for the game and noted the good abilities of his opponent, but his advisors doubted the loss until the last. Xiao got all sixes and this meant victory, so the players shook hands and were about to leave. It seems that Xiao began to guess what was going on, but Mr. Jia turned to Jan's boss and said that he would wait for the money for the game to be transferred to his account, and he was going on vacation. Sister Ken reluctantly agreed, but in her head she thought that this old crazy man had changed the rules and lost the bet and still had the nerve to talk about payment. At the exit, Mr. Jia turned around and asked the name of his young rival and Xiao answered him. An employee of the Long Company, having heard the guy's name, asked in surprise, as if it was impossible. After the game, the Long family and Su sat at the table drinking wine and discussing the latest events, and Xiao said that Mr. Jia's action lived up to his title as the betting king. He continued that Mr. Jia allowed him to win in order to have debtors later and Long thanked him for his timely help, but Xiao objected that he receives money for his work, so there is no need to pay attention to this. Zheng Lin said that now if Xiao has any problems in the city, he can count on the help of the Long family and their conversation was disturbed by Ji Jun's severe cough. Xiao took notice of this and approached Ji Jun, saying that he should not take this medicine, taking the glass of wine from his hands. The man looked at him and asked how he knew about the medicine, and Xiao calmly replied that he smelled it when he stood nearby and added that he was taking this medicine to relieve pain from internal wounds, but there was one thing. The effect will be effective if you take the medicine on a regular basis, otherwise the situation will only worsen and the man replied that knowing so much about this medicine, Xiao probably knows who the supplier of these drugs is. Xiao replied that this medicine was provided to relieve pain to those whose internal wounds were very serious and bordering on death, and Ji Jun's wounds were already incurable, but Xiao offered his help in the treatment. The man laughed loudly, because he had traveled half the world in search of a cure and found only something that would ease his suffering, but would not cure him, and did not believe that there was no limit to the guy's healing abilities, but Xiao objected that for every high mountain there was even higher and it was worth a try. Ji Jun with all his might in the chest, causing blood to pour out of his mouth along with a cry of pain. The man's body burned with blue fire as he vomited clots of blood, and Xiao silently watched the changes in his condition. This scared those present very much and Long shouted for someone to come to his aid, but looking at Ji Jun again, he cancelled his order. The husband rose from his knees and felt much better and his appearance even indicated that there was a new surge of strength. Xiao said that he would give him a prescription to take for a few days and his condition would improve, he also noted that his internal trauma was due to problems during qi refining and Ji Jun was speechless as to how the guy could know all this. Su added that his services are not free and testing the drug on a man costs 1 million, and buying the drug 10 million and he will wait for news of recovery. Ji Jun thought for a while and realized that Xiao's punch was full of qi energy and this recipe was worth it, so he asked Long to bring 10 million. Xiao refused the money, which shocked everyone present, but he explained that in return he wanted something as valuable as his recipe. He said that he wanted to use one place called Zhangshanping and Long replied that there was no problem, but this area was not yet developed. Long added that this place is very far away and he would like to know what he needs and Tang Xiao asked to bring a letter of paper for a visual example. When Xiao finished, he began to say that this drawing depicts a traditional Chinese mansion, but Long was only surprised by the fact that in a few minutes the guy managed to draw such an ideal design. Long thought that by making this place according to this sketch, it would definitely become one of the show buildings, so he asked Su to give him the sketch and Su agreed, because it was not difficult for him. Thanking for such generosity, Long promised to pay him 10 million and offered to live in his mansion near Zhangshamping for the duration of construction, and Xiao agreed, thanking him in return. Having made a verbal agreement, they decided to immediately go to the mansion to survey the area and Xiao looked forward to finally seeing Zhangshamping. In the car, they drove in silence while Xiao looked at the message from his mother that she was fine and would go to bed early today, but then Long turned to him. As a reward, he handed him the phone and said that his number was written down there so that Xiao could easily contact him and then neutrally asked what Xiao's plans were for the future. Su asked what exactly he was interested in looking at his business and Long replied that the most important target audience was women and children, so he needed to focus his resources on developing niche markets specifically for them. Su said that he had a lot of skin care recipes and Long replied that he could help with sales channels in this area, 
but he couldn't believe that this guy had so many different recipes. Understanding what Long was getting at, Xiao said that he would allow him to invest these hundred million and Long was surprised at his observation, and then added that he would prepare everything that was needed and Xiao first of all asked to find an administrative specialist. Zheng Lin immediately nominated himself for the post, but Long dismissed him, asking Xiao what duties were required of the staff in order to better understand his needs. Pressing the button on the car door, Xiao opened the window and confidently said that he wanted everything to be the best. Meanwhile, Ji Jun was looking at the recipe Xiao had given him and was surprised that drugs could be made in this way. At that moment, his daughter Sayumiai returned home and asked why he was awake at such a late hour and, going up to her room, warned her father not to drink at night. She was already climbing the stairs while Ji Jun sat and thought that Tang Xiao was not as simple as it might seem. Our heroes had already reached the mansion and Long asked Xiao's opinion and repeated that he could stay here as long as he wanted, and tomorrow they would pick him up to take him to school. Zheng Lin, walking, said that when he was free, he would definitely visit, and Xiao, in turn, thought that this particular place was filled with spiritual energy and it could help him. He went to the entrance of the house, took off his clothes to the waist and sat down to meditate, filling himself with strength. Xiao continued to concentrate on his inner strength, and suddenly felt a surge of spiritual energy from Shaishanping. For twenty minutes he wandered around the outskirts of that place, looking for the source of the surge of energy. His feelings did not let him down and, trusting his instincts, he found what he was looking for and was frankly surprised by it. In front of him he saw a large snake with red eyes that was emitting this powerful energy. Xiao was surprised that there could be such aggressive beasts of the true Yuan level on earth and planned to take away the power of the snake. The snake sensed that a threat was coming and went on the offensive first, defending itself from the danger. Xiao thought through his tactics against a powerful enemy and concentrated his inner strength to strike back. He swung the snake right in the eye, showing his dominant skills and establishing his dominance. The guy struck, but it was not strong enough and he had to run away from the attack of the snake's tail. He managed to avoid the blow, but the snake prepared a backup plan and sprayed its poison on him. After this, the snake disappeared for seconds and Xiao was afraid that he had lost sight of it, but the beast again appeared behind him and, opening its mouth, tried to catch him. Xiao saw that the snake was wrapping itself around his body and squeezing his bones until his bones crunched, leaving no way to resist or even breathe. The guy realized that his current body cannot compete with the power of this beast, so he needs to get rid of it in other ways. Charged with spiritual power, Xiao tore his hand out of the serpent's grip and dealt a crushing blow, piercing right through his body. From the pain caused, the snake splashed out all its Yuan energy, falling half-dead to the ground. Xiao walked up to the beast's lifeless body and said victoriously that if he planned to take his real Yuan, then he would take it. He was about to leave, but a strange smell caught his attention and decided to go see where it came from. The smell came from rare herbs and Xiao thought that this was the snake's reserve for cultivation, so he would take them too. Returning back, he told the already dead snake that he would not waste a single piece of his body in vain. Meanwhile, renovation work was raging at the restaurant, as promised by the three criminals. The boss urged the workers on until he was tapped on the shoulder and turned out to be Xiao, who came to check whether the perpetrators of the pogrom kept their word. He also asked where his mother was and heard that she had gone to the store, and then called the boss of this company to follow him. He said that he had removed their acupuncture points and now they would not be in pain, and then ordered them to bring everything that was left there from the yard and go about their business. They looked at each other, checking whether Xiao had really freed them from his punishment and bowed and asked to become his servants. The boss said that they had been in pain for the past few nights and were convinced of his skills, so they wanted to learn this technique from him and work for something serious, but Xiao replied that it was not so easy to learn from him, but to you might think about working for him. Xiao told the three to stay away from this store and he would call when he needed something, and then handed him a card with a million in balance, telling him to keep an eye on the store's needs while helping his mother. He also warned them that if his orders were not followed, pain was not the worst thing that awaited them, and after listening, they promised to do their work conscientiously. Meanwhile, the students in the class were waiting for the results of the latest monthly test to be handed out to them, and Chuling was worried whether Xiao would get a higher score than him. He approached Xiao, asking for his ball, but Xiao had not even received his report card yet and another student entered the office, saying that Tang Xiao was being called to the principal. 
Xiao didn't understand the reason, but he went and entered the office, saw his previous and current class teachers at the principal's desk and asked what was the matter. Mr. Hu shouted that Xiao had failed the exam, but Xiao assured not to say such nonsense, and Professor Han also said that this was slander, because Tang Xiao had been studying very conscientiously lately. Professor Han assured that Tang Xiao goes to the library every day after class, but Professor Hu wants to check the result, because Xiao received almost the highest grade. The principal noted that if Xiao waived, he would be forced to leave school, but Xiao said that he was willing to retake the exam in the presence of Professor Hu. Xiao put forward a condition that if it turned out that he wrote honestly, then Professor Hu should be held accountable for his words and Mr. Hu boiled over, saying that he would resign if the test was written the same way as this one. He left the office saying that he would be notified when the exam was ready, and Mr. Hu shouted after him to watch his behavior and Professor Han should also go to class. Walking out immediately after Xiao, she asked if he had even thought about the consequences, because, having received a lower grade, he had to leave school. But he did not react to her, but when he turned around, he again saw his ex-wife in front of him, who was calling him by name. He froze, looking at her and she confusedly asked what was the matter as his hand reached towards her. Tang Xiao held her close to him in a haze and kissed her as if she were truly the love of his life. Han was shocked by this act and how quickly she could push Xiao away from her. She was angry at her student's insolence and slapped him in the face with a rhetorical question whether he had gone crazy. And then Xiao shouted that she must pay for everything she had done, and these words led Han to despair. She screamed that she would not have left him there if these people had not been chasing her. But Xiao did not understand what she was talking about, and she continued that her father was involved in the crime at that time. Having collected all the records, she was noticed by criminals and they began to pursue her. They lost track of the crowd, but it hit around the corner where the criminals were heading. And then she decided to run, despite the fact that the red light was on at the crossing. A car was approaching her at high speed and she had nowhere to escape from the deadly wheels. But at the last moment, when she was already saying goodbye to life, Xiao ran up and, pushing her away, took the blow. Everything happened very quickly and as soon as Khan came to her senses, she tried to bring her savior to her feelings. However, she did not have time to do anything, because she heard the voices of the criminals pursuing her. She was between two fires and with a pain in her heart had to leave the bleeding guy in order to save herself. She was wildly reproached by her conscience for her action and tears covered the road like a veil, but she still ran away, despite the unbearable desire to help. After everything settled down, she found out that Xiao was in a coma, and when he came out, she got a job at the school because of her father's connections and she thought that due to the consequences of the accident, Xiao's studies began to decline. She added that she tried to do everything in her power so that Xiao would not be expelled from school, but at that time he was thinking about something completely different, namely that because of her he died in the immortal world, but also because of her he had the opportunity to go there and what his life would be like if he didn't get there. While he was in his thoughts, Han continued that she would ask the principal not to expel him from school in case of a lower grade, but he interrupted her and assured her to trust him. With these words, he walked past her and said that he would think about forgiveness. He again plunged into thought that he did not need to run, because there was no fuss, Qingqin, and she cannot answer him why she betrayed him. In the evening, in his mansion, Xiao began to brew a potion, which should have been enough to practice the first level of the immortality spell. He literally stewed in this potion, filling himself with the energy of immortality. He looked back and saw that he had been in space for about a month, flying around him. Feeling incredible speed in his body, he seemed to come to life again after a long sleep. He was filled with the energy of the moon, which seemed to be tearing him apart from the inside with its power. Having gathered enough energy, he felt stronger than ever and, with his arms outstretched, he screamed with incredible energy. Meanwhile, Zhen Long sat in his house, replaying in his head Xiao's last words that he needed the best. His thoughts were interrupted by the butler with the message that Mr. Chu I had arrived and immediately after these words a young man came in with the words why Long was drinking in private, but Long immediately asked the purpose of the visit, to which he received the answer that the previous time Long himself had asked, find him a manager. Chu Yi glanced behind him, pointing to the girl he came with and asked Long if he knew who she was. Long greeted him modestly and the girl introduced herself as a well-known professional Wall Street manager. 
Chu Yi ceremoniously announced that he had found the best manager, because she refused almost everyone in order to cooperate with the Long family, but Zhen Yu disappointed the guests, because he was not the one who needed a manager. He said that this was for a friend and Chu Yi was surprised, because he didn't know who had the strength to ask Mr. Long himself to find a manager, and Long responded, that this is a young 18-year-old guy. Chu Yi thought it was a joke, but Long turned to Miss Kong Xia and said that she would not easily accept his proposals and should immediately talk to Xiao on the phone. Kong Xia politely agreed to talk and Long picked up the phone to call Xiao. Long listened to the long telephone beeps and did not understand why Xiao was not answering and even began to worry a little about him. Xiao at this time continued his ritual to restore immortal energy and was in the midst of the process. Having descended to the ground, he saw a split vat of the drug and, hearing a phone call from Mr. Long, hurried to take it. Su said that he was busy, so he didn't answer right away, and Mr. Long got down to business, saying that he had found him a manager with whom he could discuss everything over the phone. Kang Xia said hello and introduced herself as a professional manager and Xiao asked what her requirements were, to which he received the answer that she wanted to do something interesting and was not short of money and Xiao replied that she would manage the company. He continued that he was only presenting a prototype of the product and capital, and when the company was successful, Kang Xia would receive 5% of the shares and this surprised her very much. Xiao asked her if she was okay with this and she replied that first she needed to see what she had to work with and offered to meet and discuss everything in person. In a cold tone, Xiao agreed and hung up the phone, and Chu Yi asked Miss Kong if she would really accept his proposal, after all, she had refused his personal agreements dozens of times. But she was openly interested in Tang Xiao's project and was looking forward to the meeting to see with her own eyes how good his idea was. Tang Xiao walked around the house and stopped at a marble table and lightly pressed it with his finger, causing it to crack. By pressing a little harder, the massive table shattered into small pieces, signaling the return of strength. Xiao was glad that he was finally able to cope with the difficulties of scraping out the outer layer caused by the spell and now he did not have to worry about dying during the practice. He began to get dressed and thought that he almost died if the spell of immortality had not worked in time and looking in the mirror he noticed that his hair was suddenly getting longer and needed to be cut. His clothes became too small for him due to the increased size of his body and this is another consequence of the spell, and thinking about this, someone knocked on his door. He slowly walked to the door and opened it, not knowing who might come to him at such a late time. Xiao saw Jijun and asked what was the matter because his wound should have already been healed, but Mr. Jijun was still surprised by the incredible height of the guy, because in the previous meeting he was much shorter. Mr. Long, meanwhile, sent the guest and said that in the future she would contact Xiao directly, and she said goodbye and went home. Chu Yi stayed with Long and asked him to also arrange a meeting with Tang Xiao, but Long asked why a wealthy metropolitan personality was interested in him, especially since now was not a convenient time for a meeting because Long wanted to test Xiao's abilities in more detail. Chu Yi even more interested and knows that Tang Xiao will become very influential in the near future. Xiao, meanwhile, answered Ji Jun that his height did not concern him and waved his hand for him to go inside. They walked through the yard and Ji Jun noticed a scattered heap of valuable herbs and huge snake bones, and he was afraid to imagine what was happening here. He suspected that Xiao was not just a person, but something supernatural, and they went inside the house when Xiao offered to sit down. While passing through a large room, Jijun stepped on a piece of a marble table and was shocked that such a strong product was broken to the ground. He heard, that only a spell of the highest level of practice can allow one to break a stone and his thoughts were interrupted by Xiao with his question whether he came here through these rubble. He said that he had come to thank Xiao for his healing and also to offer an agreement to sell his recipes. Despite the agreement, he had one more request and knelt down and asked to be accepted into the ranks of Tang Xiao's disciples. Ji Jun added that he wanted to improve the practice of the spell under his guidance, but Xiao clearly answered him, but the man continued to persuade him. Xiao objected that Ji Jun is not the kind of person who needs to explain something, so he said again that he is not accepting any students now, but they can cooperate on the issue of patented Chinese cosmetics. The guy added that when he runs the skin care company, he will need someone who will provide materials and production of products, and if Ji Jun agrees to cooperate, he will receive 5% of the shares and the man agreed. Ji Jun assured that he could be relied on and, when leaving, 
said that he still hoped that Xiao would consider taking him as a student and received a response of a silent look of protest. Xiao said goodbye and Jijun bowed and said to call him when necessary. Finally, Xiao asked not to tell Officer Chen Xiumei that they knew each other and Jijun excitedly asked how Xiao knew that they were relatives. Xiao replied that he noticed a reaction to his name, also the technique of checking the pulse and the same smell, in general it was simple for him. Two days later, Professor Han walked to school, engrossed in thoughts of her first ever kiss with Tang Xiao, which happened so unexpectedly. All eyes were on Tang Xiao and all the comments talked about his tall stature, incredible charm and new hairstyle. Chuling compared that Xiao was already almost the same height as him and at that moment Miss Han came up to them with the same comment about his height and Xiao asked what exactly was the matter. She replied that today was the day of the exam and she was worried about Xiao and wished him good luck, but Xiao reassured her that she should trust him, because everything would go smoothly. Miss Han was about to leave, but at the last moment she called Xiao to say something, but just as quickly changed her mind and simply wished her luck. Chuling noticed some tension between them and mockingly asked and they managed to become so close, but Xiao cut off his ridicule. Xiao noticed Miss Han's strange behavior, but remained silent and went to the principal's office to complete the re-exam. The principal said that Xiao could do it on the sofa and Mr. Hu would grade it immediately, but it was difficult for the teacher not to notice Xiao's increase in height. Xiao got to work, noting that Mr. Hu kept his promise and the teacher immediately confirmed that he would immediately resign if the test was correct. Mr. Hu was happy, because he had been working on the tests for almost a week to make them super difficult so that Xiao would definitely fail them, but after an hour Xiao completed it and the teacher began to test. Meanwhile, Xiao arranged a meeting with Miss Kang Xia, although he was more impressed by the telephone conversation, and at that moment Mr. Hu's cry was heard throughout the entire office that this was impossible. Xiao understood why he had such a reaction, so he stood up and asked the director for permission to leave, and the director kindly let him go. An indignant Mr. Hu asked how he did it, but Su replied that it was none of his business and that he should think about a new job. Leaving the door, Su added that the questions he answered incorrectly should have been chosen better and he made these mistakes only out of respect for the teacher's knowledge. Xiao walked down the corridor and thought that although he had mastered the difficulty of scraping out the outer layer with the help of medicinal herbs, he had achieved most of the rapid progress in such a short period thanks to the monster. He realized that he could not make any breakthrough without these herbs and thought to ask Jijun first, because he knows how to produce his products. While he was lost in thought, Khan passed by him and he did not notice her, but she called him and asked him to stay with her. For a second she even regretted her words, but Xiao showed an approving gesture. He looked back at her and said that now was the time to have lunch together, and she happily agreed. They continued to walk, but now side by side, and Xiao carelessly apologized for that kiss, but Han shrugged it off as if it was not so important, although she herself thought about it every day. Arriving home, Xiao saw his three new workers in his mother's store, who were happily doing their job to help his mother. One of the workers came through the door and said that he had come here again. Xiao asked who exactly they were talking about, but after not receiving an answer, he decided to go see it in person. Coming out to the entrance, Xiao immediately recognized the uninvited guest, who was smoking a cigarette with his back to him. Approaching closer, Xiao asked Su Shangguan why he came here, but the uncle asked in surprise how he became so tall, but Xiao sarcastically asked in response whether it was anxiety over his height that was the reason for the visit. Noticing the hint of mockery in his voice, Su Shang shouted for Xiao to watch his words, because he was his elder, to which Xiao asked whether he even deserved to be his elder. Bodyguard wanted to clarify the situation of disrespect with his fists, but Xiao's mother blocked them and said that she gave the money a few days ago. After these words, Xiao grabbed the bodyguard's hand and pushed him away from him, causing him to hit his head on Su Shang's head. Su Shang boiled with rage and shouted that thanks to him they live a happy life and Xiao has no right to treat him like that, and with these words, banknotes rained down in his face. Xiao said that this money was enough for him to get out of here and hastily picking up the scattered bills, his uncle said that they should be his anyway. Having collected the money, Su Shanwen was about to leave, but Xiao pulled his bodyguard by the shoulder, saying that no one allowed him to go. After that, Xiao and his subject were sitting in the backyard of the store and the man dared to tell him something, 
despite his mother's request not to tell anything. The husband said that, despite the increase in turnover, the store has very high expenses, because Su Shan comes very often and asks for large sums of money and they even plan to beat him, but Xiao's mother did not allow it, because this is not like a relative. After listening, Xiao replied that on his next such visit he would not look at the fact that this was his uncle. Xiao added that they should not take into account his mother's comments and teach the trash Su Shang a lesson. The man understood everything and asked what to do with Su Shang's bodyguard lying in the backyard, and Xiao replied that he had lost consciousness due to a broken arm and would wake up tomorrow. The next day, Xiao went to school, listening to a boring lecture on the key components of the college entrance exam. The teacher did not have time to present all the material during the lesson, so he asked everyone to stay for an additional lesson and Xiao informed Kang Xia that he would not be able to meet with her and let her come to his class. Kang Xia approached the 10th grade and noticed Han, who was thinking about the tests she needed to check, but saw a stranger and came up to say hello. Miss Han asked why she came here, because she is the homeroom teacher of this class and could help. Kang Xia greeted kindly and began to explain who exactly she was looking for, but at that moment students began to leave the classrooms, there was no longer any need for this. Chuling, seeing the beauty Kang Xia, thought that she had come to him, but she called Mr. Tang Xiao, which surprised Miss Han. Kang Xia stared at Tang Xiao for a few seconds, which looked strange and Xiao asked if there might be something wrong with him. Kang Xia replied that she was surprised by his spectacular appearance and Xiao, in a calm tone, suggested going to discuss work issues at a cafe bar near the school. Xiao told Chuling that he couldn't go with him today because of a meeting, although his friend's eyes begged him to take him with him, and meanwhile Miss Han was replaying Kang Xia's name in her head as if she had seen her somewhere before. Han remembered that she had seen this girl on the cover of a magazine and she was a professional manager, but Han didn't understand why she came to Xiao unless they were a couple. Chuling approached her with a request for help, and she kindly agreed. Meanwhile, a business conversation was taking place at the cafe bar table and Kang Xia said that she would study and test the product and only after two weeks she would decide whether to accept the offer of cooperation or not, depending on the results of the research. Kang Xia asked the last question, is Tang Xiao afraid that she will steal his program and capital and simply leave? Su replied that for such a professional manager as she calls herself, such a small profit would not be a temptation. Chuling just called him. Chuling's worried voice said that Miss Han had been stolen and he should return immediately. Meanwhile, at the school, the policeman was telling the help on the phone to hurry up, because they don't know what that bastard is capable of, and at that moment the school principal ran out. He asked what happened and the local police investigator said that he was on the trail of a dangerous suspect who had been successfully hiding from the police for a long time. As soon as he was hiding in this school and when he recognized the investigator, he kidnapped the teacher as a hostage. A student who was nearby at that moment made a phone call and volunteered to be a hostage instead of the teacher. The investigator refused, but the student did not serve and now the suspect locked himself in the office along with the hostage and the student. The suspect has already put forward conditions and they are waiting for negotiators and regimental police officers, and the investigator noted the importance of cooperation between everyone present at the school and the police. He also said that none of the students and teachers should enter the school while it is dangerous here, and at these words he faltered when he saw the angry boss. From a running start, she slapped the investigator, saying that he would bear full responsibility if anything happened to the hostage and the investigator admitted his guilt in this situation. Chief Sayumiai ordered the investigator to leave, because the regimental police had already arrived, who would sort everything out, and at that moment a crash was heard outside the office door alerting the boss. Together with the investigator, they stood on the sides of the door and waited for the right moment to enter. A second later, a heavy blow was heard and the suspect flew out of the office, breaking the door with his body. Having flown through the corridor, the suspect did not reduce his intensity and Chief Shumei shouted that he could fall out of the veranda, and they did not need corpses here. They could not do anything and the criminal was already on the verge of the railing, but at the last moment a miracle happened. With incredible speed, Tang Xiao appeared and grabbed the criminal by the clothes, dragged him out of the railing and threw him into the corridor. This act looked like something out of a superhero movie and the investigator put it on the phone, that the hostages are safe and the suspect is under control. Before all this happened, 
Chuling tried to deal with the suspect on his own, but he failed. Chuling to the ground with one blow, leaving no chance of defense while Han screamed not to touch him. While Chuling was resting, the criminal mocked that he could not help the hostage with such a weak body. Looking at Han, the suspect said that it was time to play more adult games until this little bastard couldn't stand up for a while. Chuling tried his best to stop the criminal and was only able to grab his leg, but at that moment the criminal turned around and pointed the barrel of the gun at his head. For the criminal, Chuling was not an obstacle and he said that he hated being grabbed by the legs more than Chuling wrote out a death sentence for himself. Tang Xiao was standing on the roof of a nearby building at this time, observing the activities in the office. At the sound of a scuffle, he turned around and walked away to gain momentum for the jump. Pushing off from the edge, he jumped, trying to get into the right window. He knew for sure that his jump was impeccable and, breaking the glass, he flew into the office. The criminal turned his attention from Chuling to the arriving guest and pointed a gun at him, but this did not frighten Xiao at all. He taunted that Xiao had appeared as Spider-Man and did not hesitate to shoot him straight in the face. From the bullet, Tang Xiao only had a scratch on his face, which shocked the criminal, because it was impossible from such a close shot. Charged with power, Tang Xiao hit the pagan in the chest and a pistol flew out of his hands. Xiao noticed that the criminal was too talkative and he corrected this with his crushing blow. After this, an ambulance arrived, and Chief Xiumei was surprised that Xiao was able to overcome such a dangerous criminal. She took statements, but could not believe that Xiao got into the office from the top floor, because she was there and noticed it. Xiao said that it was not his problem, that she did not believe him and was about to leave, but Chief Xiumei shouted that he should cooperate with the police, but he replied that he did not want to continue cleaning up the mess that she made. She realized that she was really to blame for what happened and, with her eyes downcast, thanked him for his help. She also said that Xiao would be awarded a Samaritan certificate, but he, after thanking him, said that they should give it to Chuling, who emotionally proved his heroism to the policeman. Xiao was already leaving, but Chief Xiumei stopped him and, unexpectedly for Xiao, extended her hand to him. With a quick movement, she placed her fingers on his neck to record his pulse and was shocked by the result. Tang Xiao removed her hand because he was surprised by such a gesture and looked at Chief Xiumei with a questioning look. Chuling called Xiao and said that Miss Han was inviting them to her place for dinner today. Xiao was glad that Chuling was feeling better and, ignoring the recent situation with Chief Xiumei, walked past, saying that they would see each other soon. Already the three of them left and Chuling reported that he and Miss Han told the police everything in accordance with Su's words and Su thanked the owner of the Samaritan letter for this. Chief Xiumei in turn was thinking how Tang Xiao's pulse could beat so quickly and he even looked like a different person, so something had changed dramatically. Two days later, all the news showed that student Yang Chuling had eliminated a dangerous criminal and helped the police arrest him. Xiumei sat on the sofa and looked through Tang Xiao's biography, listening to the news about the situation, until her father entered the room asking why she was not at work. He walked up to her and, seeing what she was looking at, asked why she was so concerned about Tang Xiao's identity. Xiumei noticed that her father's tone changed when he saw Xiao's photo, so she asked for the name of the master who cured him a few days ago, but did not receive an answer by phone call. She was informed that the criminal had died in the hospital and, telling her father that she needed to run for work, she flew out of the house. He also received a phone call, but he did not immediately notice it because of his daughter's excitement. Upon arrival, she was informed that the criminal was killed deliberately, because the one who did it had broken the camera in advance, stunned the guard and strangled the criminal in the ward. Chief Shumei was upset because they didn't even have time to interrogate him and put forward the theory that he was killed by his own accomplices, who did not want him to tell the police the truth. On the other hand, she thought that if this group of foreign drug traffickers could enter Xingqing, then they should be supported by other forces and how they entered Xingqing should be investigated first. Meanwhile, Mr. Ji Jun was talking to Tang Xiao, who asked if he knew where he could buy rare herbs. Xiao explained that his next recipe needed a lot of rare herbs and he thought that Ji Jun should know where to get them, and the man replied that he had several friends who sold herbs and asked which ones he needed. After discussing everything, Xiao said that he would come later and pick up the herbs and see what else he needed besides them. Xiao said that he met Chen the other day Xiumei emphasized that she should know less about their cooperation and about him in general, and at that moment Ji Jun loudly dropped the phone. 
He apologized for this and, concluding the conversation, said that he would carry out his instructions, to which Xiao replied that he would contact him later and after the conversation, Ji Jun thought that he needed to be careful with his daughter, because Xiao has very good intuition. Then he put forward a theory that Xiao Mei's curiosity about Tang Xiao could be caused by her sympathy for him and imagining them as a couple, Ji Jun almost turned gray on the spot. Returning from the balcony to his room in the boys' dormitory, he asked how Chuling was doing. Hearing the answering silence, he saw that Chuling was sleeping on the table and, having rolled up the notebook, Xiao hit him on the back of the head. Chuling himself asked him to help with his studies, and as soon as Xiao left, he managed to fall asleep, so Xiao ordered him to finish writing faster. The friends did not even suspect that they were being hunted from the roof of a house nearby. The sniper took aim while a friend stood with him and the third returned with food and drink. These three started to take revenge on Chuling for Charles, but a bullet in the forehead was too easy a punishment and one of them came up with a slightly better idea. For now they were just watching him through the sight and Jason also wanted to take a look at the future dead man. But as soon as he looked, he saw Tang Xiao's gaze, which seemed to look straight into his soul, without looking at the distance. They were wary, but one of them said that the guy could not see them at a distance of 500 meters, because he was an ordinary person. He reassured them that the guy just happened to look in their direction, so they shouldn't be foolish and pack their things to leave the roof. Chuling's photograph, they were about to leave, but for some reason one of them became wary. And he was wary for good reason, because after telling Chuling that he would leave for a while, Xiao jumped out of the window to meet the trio. Xiao's abilities were not yet strong enough to hear what they were talking about, but he could see them and knew that they were involved with that foreigner he had beaten the other day. Having gone downstairs, Xiao ran to where he felt their presence, but did not know that he was also being followed. He ran up to the building, but no longer felt any activity, as if they had already left there, and the man running behind him could barely catch his breath to keep up with the incredibly fast guy. Xiao arrived at the top of the building and heard the burning smell of a burnt photograph. The guy found a piece of their school uniform there and realized that someone wanted to stir up the school. He also found a shoe print, but most of all he was interested in the man around the corner and he told him to come out, because he didn't have time to play hide and seek with him. The husband came out saying that he was surprised by the guy's observation skills, because before becoming Jia's senior student Ruedao, he was a scout in the special forces, but Xiao still noticed him. Now Xiao understood why Jia Ruedao allowed him to win, because he did not plan to just let the guy go, and Xiao asked what exactly was the matter and the man replied that his master was in trouble because of gambling on Jingmen Island. Am Jia Ruedao said that Xiao is the only person who can help him and therefore he asks to immediately go to the island, but Xiao had important matters and besides there were entrance exams coming up and the director would not allow him to leave. The husband noticed that it would be okay if they arrived in a week and he would talk to teacher Xiao for him, begging him to help the master, and Xiao also bowingly said that he would take half of the winning money for himself. Xiao walked towards the exit and told the man to contact him when he got everything straightened out. Turning around, he told the man not to follow him around anymore, otherwise he would find out what could happen. The next day, Chuling was getting ready for school and his mother wanted him to stay to meet his father, who is rarely at home, but Chuling did not agree, because Tang Xiao himself would teach him. She shouted after them to come back with a friend when they quit and she was glad that her son had finally taken up his studies and here some man turned to her. Turning around, she was scared, because she saw a pistol in his hands and he ordered her to follow him. He brought her to an abandoned factory outside the city and when she began to resist, he again threatened her with a pistol and brutal punishment. He was distracted by a knock on the door and, moving away from Mrs. Yang, he went to check who had come. It was his colleagues, but they arrived earlier than they would have and the dark-skinned man explained something was wrong. He explained that the police be is investigating local agencies because of Charles and while buyers cannot buy drugs. The leader of the gang, in a rage, shot at the ceiling, demanding whether they even know how difficult it is for them to cope with this here. But he already had a plan and turned to the long-haired miller and told him to be gentle with Yang Chuling's mother, because he should get the perfect dead mother. Slyly licking the blade of the knife, Miller obediently and happily went to carry out his boss's orders. Meanwhile, Xiao and Chuling were studying textbooks, but Chuling was mostly just fooling around. Xiao was annoyed by this and wanted to crack him, 
but Chuling's father called and said that his mother had disappeared. In rage, he slammed his hand on the table and ran out of the library without a word. Xiao heard the conversation with his father and began to guess that the three men probably thought that Chuling had beaten the foreigner and kidnapped his mother. He also mentioned that the shoe print on the roof contained dust the same as when making porcelain and then he killed in the search all possible locations associated with this. Having found only one abandoned porcelain factory on the map, he decided to get there and correct the mistake. At this time, the taxi drivers were already finishing work and leaving for their personal affairs. Tang Xiao stopped one of them and got into the car, despite the fact that the taxi driver shouted that he was no longer working and was not going anywhere. But Xiao showed him a wad of money in a geolocation and told him to go there as soon as possible, and the taxi driver, seeing the money, pressed the gas pedal. Ten minutes later, they were already there, but the taxi driver warned that this factory had not been operating for more than seven years, but Xiao was only worried that he felt the presence of people there and Chuling's mother in the first place. Xiao ordered the taxi driver to call the police and report that he saw three suspicious foreigners outside the city and, handing over the money, said to keep quiet about his coming here otherwise he would get into trouble and the taxi driver replied that he could be relied on. When the taxi driver drove off, Xiao was thinking through tactics, because his body can only withstand small caliber bullets and he is not sure that he can withstand more serious weapons and, concentrating on the building, he realized that he could only experience the presence of two people at a time. But, turning his concentration to another part of the building, he felt that Chuling's mother was in mortal danger. A maniac with a knife approached the woman and said in disappointment that he thought she would be prettier and planned to first cut off her ears and send her to her son. Raising his head, the maniac saw Tang Xiao sitting in the window and was frightened by the unexpected guest. Tang Xiao waved his hand so that he cut the maniac's throat without the help of a knife. Blood began to flow like a fountain from the man's neck and splash around as he fell lifeless to the floor and Mrs. Yang screamed in horror. Tang Xiao covered her mouth with his hand and calmed her down so that she would not scream, because he was her son's classmate and came here to help. She heard about him from Chuling, but Xiao had no time to scratch himself, so he ordered her to run home through the window and cancel the police report. She was interested in what would happen to him, but hearing voices from another room, Xiao told her to immediately run away while he dealt with the offenders. The leader of the gang was already walking into the room with a stupid joke about his friend when he was suddenly hit in the face. Tang Xiao literally embedded the pagan's body into the ground, breaking through the concrete floor. The dark-skinned man decided not to fight with his hands and pointed the machine gun at Tang Xiao, and then began to shoot. Tang Xiao maneuverably dodged the shots and again received only one tear on his cheek. Having reached the shooter, Tang Xiao hit him and the machine gun fell from the scumbag's hands to the ground. Blood began to drip onto his legs and Tang Xiao pushed the dead man away from him, thinking that Xing Xiao's consciousness was becoming more dominant. Soon there was a live report from the scene of a fire in an abandoned porcelain factory, which was quickly extinguished by the fire service. Sayumi Ai ran up to the presenter of the report and, breaking into the microphone, said that filming was prohibited here. She approached the investigator, who found out the cause of the fire as a result of arson, and they also found three foreigners. But they were dead before the fire and Chief Shumei screamed for them to find out the cause of death and identify them. According to the police, these three belonged to the same drug trafficking group as the previous foreigner, and their death was at the hands of another person, so the fire was planned. Shumei got angry, because they should have been brought before the law, and not died like that, and the investigator also said that the fat student called the alarm call center. He said that his mother was missing, but after some time he cancelled his statement with the words that she returned home and Shumei understood why. The next day in the dormitory, Chuling was ready to kiss Xiao's feet and begged to be allowed to somehow thank him for saving his mother. Xiao replied that Chuling should not do anything, because this situation was also his fault, and Chuling said that his father would invite Xiao to dinner when he was free. Chuling also said that he and Miss Han will keep his Kung Fu knowledge secret and Xiao said that Chuling is his best friend here, so he plans to teach him Kung Fu so that he can protect his family in the future. Cheers, Chuling went to hug Xiao, but he pulled him away and said that there was one condition in order to learn Kung Fu from him. Xiao will set a minimum score for his studies and Chuling's score should be higher in the entrance exams, and he should also start losing weight and this caused a strong reaction from Chuling 
because both were difficult for him. Sitting at his desk before class, Xiao thought that upon his return, these two spirits began to unite more and before this easy life, life in the immortal world became a dream for him, but if he did not have the Shinshu consciousness, he probably would not have killed those three foreigners. But he needs to stop being so sympathetic before he returns to the immortal world. The lesson began and Miss Han announced the news that Tang Xiao, as the best student in the class, was being sent to a math competition on Jingmen Island and Xiao immediately understood why exactly there and who arranged it. At that moment, Su's phone received a message from Gong Dalong saying that everything was agreed and they would see him next Monday. The second news from Miss Han was that, despite the fact that there was very little time left before the entrance exams, a new student would be coming to their class. The new student turned out to be Long Zhenglin and when he saw him, Chuling jumped up shouting what the hell he was doing here, but Zheng Lin only greeted him sweetly and said that he had not seen these two for a long time. After classes, the guys walked together and Zheng Lin was indignant that it was only his first day at school and they were leaving him to go to Jingmen Island the next morning. Zheng Lin said that he really wanted to become a true friend to Xiao, but Xiao did not believe it and asked what made him leave his happy life and come here. At that moment, a car drove up and Mr. Long got out and said that it was because of him and although Zheng Lin can be too emotional, he still respects Tang Xiao, who was as tall as Mr. Chen said. Mr. Long asked Xiao to discipline Zheng Lin and if anything happened, he could turn to him for help, and Xiao agreed and put forward the same conditions for Zheng Lin as for Chuling except for losing weight. Long suggested that everyone should have dinner at his hotel, since it was already the weekend and everyone was ready. Xiao approached Long with a favor and Long was willing to listen. Having agreed, Xiao proposed a new plan of action and everyone should go to him for dinner, and not to Long. When they arrived, Xiao shouted to his mother, who had brought several friends, and asked where the three working guys were and the mother replied that they had gone to the market. Xiao asked his mother to prepare her signature dishes and they would all have dinner together, but he noticed that she was crying, however, she replied that she just rubbed her eyes hard. But Xiao didn't believe her, so he asked Chuling to take the guests upstairs, and he asked his mother again what happened. The thing was that Su Shang still came to ask for money and Xiao's mother explained that he was now having problems with his business and he needed it, but Xiao was angry that after he gave his uncle all the money he had lent and even topped it up, he still dares to ask for more. Xiao's mother assured that she was not worried about money, but that Su Shang was not like that before, but changed when he became rich and Xiao rhetorically asked what would happen if he lost his money, but his mother began to refuse him this idea. Xiao reassured her and told her not to be discouraged anymore, because he would fix everything, and after these words, she went to prepare dinner. Having learned that Mr. Long himself was dining there, Xiao's mother's jaw almost dropped. Long explained that Yang was his partner, and Tan helped him in a difficult situation, and they decided to create a business together. Xiao's mother now understood where the money on her card came from, but Xiao did not think that she would spend it so thoughtlessly if he did not explain where it came from. She was worried about what her son was doing, but now she calmed down and Xiao said that she could spend the money as she wished. The evening was very fun and it was time to leave and the guests said goodbye and got into Long's car, who would also give Chuling a ride home. Before leaving, Long said that they would see each other when Xiao returned from the island and then Miss Kong Xia's conclusions would be known, but Xiao was worried about one more question and asked if Long knew Su Shangwen from the real estate company. Shangwen's company was in chaos as he tried to figure out the reason why their supplier was cancelling cooperation just before the start of a new project. His team did not know the answer, because the contract had already been signed, but Su Shang understood that there was no point in discussing this anymore and they had to make sure that they had enough materials to start the project. Su Shang ordered to contact 